Do you feel that in a time when we are more connected than ever, we are drifting away from real human connection, especially to ourselves? I do. Hi, I'm Leticia Latino, and I want to invite you to join me and my very inspiring guests in exploring ways to reconnect to your essence, to your definite purpose, to what makes you tick. Are you ready? Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 100th episode of Back to Basics. Wow, I cannot even believe it. What a ride it has been. And when I think that it all started two years ago when I registered in a Seth Godin and Alex De Palma online program called the Podcast Fellowship. Although I had already done several of his programs, I hesitated. Podcasting? What for? And yet, I acknowledged the butterflies in my stomach, and somehow I found the courage to be bold and brave, and here we are. So obviously, I wanted to have an extra special guest today, someone that could validate the journey. He's an entrepreneur, the author of 19 bestsellers, marketing hall of famer, TED talker, and most importantly, a unique teacher. This really is full circle moment for me because I consider him one of the major influencers in the work I produce. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Mr. Seth Godin. Hello, Seth. Wow, what a nice intro. Thanks for having me. Thank you for 100 episodes. It gets easier after 100, so bravo. Wow, it's uh, I cannot even believe it. And it all started as a joke, as I said. And uh, I mean, you would appreciate this little story, but... Although I have been part of your workshops, podcasting seemed like there's no way I can do this. And I flip a coin because that's what I often do <laughs> when, when I don't know what to do, right? And the, and the coin, it was tells no, head yes, of course, and it was a no. And it was a aha moment for me because although the coin said no, I said, screw it. I pull out my credit card and I register. And that's the that's moment great. when I rebel against myself and the coin. When you flip the coin, you already know the answer, right? When you flip the coin, that's a great blog post. I'm going to steal that from you. Absolutely. I would be honored, but it's true. I have been doing it, doing it forever, but it was the first time I say, no, screw you. I'm going to do it. <laughs> so um, Seth, as you know, back to basics, it's, it's all about the journey. So I I think most people that are listening to this, they know your story. We definitely want to touch upon your latest book, which I have here, The Practice. And I loved it. And it's amazing. But I want to learn, and we always do this with our guests, about you as a young child. What were you passionate about? The beginning. I want to know part of who you were as a young kid and then how you became Seth Godin. I'm very flattered. And I hate to disrupt your flow, but I think that that's a trap. Okay, great. And the reason, the reason it's a trap is that my childhood wasn't like anybody else's childhood. And that's true for everybody. Mm -hmm. If we are trying to figure out what path did someone take to become able to contribute in a way that we admire, we let ourselves off the hook because we know we weren't exposed to that path. Mm -hmm. And so I try very hard not to talk about my uh, origin story too much because it's not everybody else's origin story. I'm really far more interested in understanding what do we have in common and how do we take that and become a contribution with it? Because I've studied a lot of very successful people, of creative people, of happy people, and the only thing they have in common is that they don't have anything in common. Oh, I, I absolutely believe it. And and really the purpose why I like to do that is to just to know if you were passionate about writing and about spreading ideas as a young kid, because usually I make a connection to with sure. people that what they were passionate about back when they were young is eventually what they're passionate later on in their lives. But somehow through the traps of life that you discuss so much about right. how we start doing work that is e similar to everybody else, we forget about what that passion was. Yeah, no, I was, uh, I took one English class in college. My high school English teacher wrote in my yearbook that I was the bane of her existence and I would never amount to anything. Uh, nobody, nobody thought that I was going to be a writer and I didn't have any desire to be a writer. 
Interesting. And uh, is there was there anything, any like uh, aha moment or anything that when you started doing something that you never imagined you were going to do, was there anything that prompted you to go that route? Well, I have always wanted to be a teacher and I've been a teacher since a, from a very young age. And the question was, how do you teach? And when I left my job at the software company in 1986 to get married, there was no other gig like that that I could get. So I became a book packager because that's an industry that paid people for new ideas. And I liked that idea that I could show up and say, here, I made this and someone would pay me for it. So, but it turns out that in the book industry, you have to use words. And so I started using words, but I didn't look for a place to use words. I looked for a place to bring new ideas. I love that. And I love the fact that you say I wanted to be a teacher because ultimately, I mean, even in the intro I provided and people that know you know that uh, you really, that's what you're doing. You're teaching us. You're teaching anybody that's willing to to listen and be open to new ways of do, different ways of doing things. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. And in the, in the practice, you do talk a lot about here, I made this. I would love for you to, I know this is something that in many interviews you've shared, but with my audience, just is so special when you, you know, that you say, this is something, this is my podcast. It started two years ago and this is what I'm doing. I made this. And now the amazing God said Golden is also a part of it. <laughs> so there are four words in that sentence and all four words have power. The first word is here, meaning I'm giving you something. You don't have to accept it, but here, right here, here it is, I'm giving it to you. I, meaning I'm on the hook. Seth Godin made this. Leticia made this. I made this. Made because it didn't used to be here and now it's here. And this, not some amorphous feeling, this item, this thing, I made this. Here is this gift. And implied in the fact that it's a gift is you don't have to accept it. That if you don't want it, that's okay. If it's not for you, that's okay. If it doesn't resonate, that's okay. I made it anyway. And I will learn from the back and forth we are about to have. And maybe I will make you something else. Maybe I will decide I don't need or can't make things for you. But too often, our sentences are either what do you want me to do? Or our sentences are, don't blame me. And I think we need more here. I made this in our lives. I totally agree with you. And, and for, in my own experience, it has uh, been a struggle because a lot of people want to find out why I'm doing this. I'm in the telecommunications industry completely separate from, you know, doing podcasts. And I cannot even get customers with this. You know, it's so unrelated that people want me to tell them, what is your goal? And I say, the goal is I enjoy it. I enjoy having these conversations. I am growing with each guest I have in so many different walks of life. And I, I kind of get what you say. It's like, I made it. And if you want to listen to it, great. If not, it's there for anybody to discover it at some point. Right. Yes, you nailed it. Yeah, well, I, I, I've i read enough of your books. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely uh, tried to learn from the master, but it's something that clicks. And, you know, for me, it wasn't always like this. And I think that's why in terms of your journey, I'm sure uh, when you founded your first company, you said that, that I'm sure there were dark moments and there were challenging moments where you're saying, I'm never going to, where that's a moment where you say, I'm never going to be successful. This is never going to happen. And how did you overcome that moment? Those moments happen all the time. They have never stopped happening. And those moments are a symptom that you're doing something important. Because if it's sure to work, well, thanks. But lots of people could have done that. It's the stuff that's not sure to work that's rare and scarce and valuable. So I have failed many, many, many times, more pe more times than most people, because part of the art of failing is not failing so big that they kick you out of the game, but failing enough that you learn something, but not so much that you don't get to play again. And the internet makes that easier than ever before, because you, know, you can do a blog post, you can make a podcast, 
and it doesn't resonate. Oh, well, I learned something. I can do another one. That is different than violating people's trust or expectations because if you do that too many times, you don't get to play anymore. Interesting. And do you think that the quality that one needs to be like that, to say, well, I failed, let me try again. Do you think that's something that it comes with us? Because I've had people tell me this, like, well, you, you just have it in you that you would start again. And mm -hmm. I know I know it's an excuse, but how, what do we tell to people listening out there that they are there? They are like, well, I've tried, I failed, so I don't want to try anymore. Well, I would ask them if they know how to ride a bicycle. And I would ask them if they are able to walk or talk in complete sentences. Because most of the people around us can do all three of those things. And none of us were good at them when we started. So you've already demonstrated that you're willing to persist. You've already demonstrated that the first time you rode a bike, you fell off it. Maybe you even hurt yourself and you still got back on. You've done that. So that's not the question. The question is, do you care enough? And if you don't care enough, you should own that. Like there are lots of things I don't know how to do. Like I don't know how to speak French. I am capable of learning how to speak French or Spanish but I don't care enough. So I'm not willing to pay the price. I, I totally agree. I, I have a few friends that say my passion is this. And then you see like the perfect opportunity and I'm jumping for them because I say, oh, this is it. You got it. And then they come up with a big list of why not. And right. uh, I think that's really that space. And, and even in people, when I say I'm lucky enough that Seth Godin said, you know, yes, to come into my podcast and say, ask him how to get unstuck. How do we get unstuck when you feel you cannot do it? I say, well, you should start by reading his books. That will get you unstuck. <laughs> <laughs> But sure, I'll ask the question. So when you see someone that stuck, do you have any particular advice? Well, it's not, it's not as satisfying as people might want, but it's simple, which is you don't feel like something and then do it we do something and then we feel it. So if you want to be a runner, you don't wait to feel like a runner. You just go running. And if you go running 30 times in a row, you're a runner. The, the great philosopher Dolly Parton said, find out who you are and do it on purpose. And I disagree with her. I agree with her on so many things, but I disagree with her about this. I don't think we find out who we are and do it on purpose. I think we do things on purpose and that helps us find out who we are. Right. Because if you do the thing, you can become the doer. I totally agree with you. Um, I, I feel that's like, yeah, even by doing this podcast, I became a podcaster just by the fact that uh, through your two month course and, and we learn everything. I didn't know people thought, well, I don't know how to edit. Well, I didn't know how to edit. And, and then all those little steps that if you want it, you're going to learn it and you're going to do it. And then. Kaboom, you get right. Seth Godin on your podcast. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, getting Seth Godin on your podcast isn't as big a prize as you might think. The hard work is you've shown up a hundred times. You have people who look forward to hearing from you. You have people who you are part of their life and you have never met them. Some of those people are telling their friends. That is the hard part. Getting an outsider to say, I'll be on your podcast. That's nice, but that's not the purpose. That's not the point. Absolutely. No. And, and believe it or not, it's not so much because of who you are. It's because of who you've been in my life that I make a big deal of it because I've read every word. I follow your blogs and, and you know, it's just the work you do matters. And I know that's one of your main things. And, and just for me, it's full circle that, that you know that it had mattered in my life. The podcast is one thing, but how I sell to customers, how I engage with customers. Like I used to take things very personal, like, and now it's not. Now it's like, I know my value. I know what we're bringing to the table. It's up there. You want it, you take it. If not, move on. And, and you know, I'll, I'll go find a customer that values that. And, and you really instilled that in me. That's great. I love to hear that. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, I was, uh, you know, to also hear how you impacted others people because I've had many guests in this podcast and, and, you know, eventually something about what something said, Godin said or wrote somewhere, you know, comes to the conversation. So it's really amazing work. And, and I, and I'm sure that it's been a long journey and that, uh, you know, Seth Godin didn't become Seth Godin overnight. I mean, just by 
all all your book bookshelf that's behind you is proof. <laughs> <laughs> so is there any idea that you still get passionate about that you haven't pursued? I'm sure there's many, but anything you want to share that is exciting at the time besides your book? Well, I don't think we've gone nearly far enough in exploring how much good we can do when we connect to other people and open a door for them. It's the 80th birthday of my third grade teacher this week. And in 1968, he changed my life. And because he changed my life, I got the chance to speak to other people and make an impact on their life and the ripples and the ripples and the ripples. And yet, most third grade teachers are indoctrinated in getting kids to be obedient, coercing them to do well on the test, having them fit in. We don't spend nearly enough time encouraging people, whatever they do for a living, to see who's actually behind the work and to help that person get to the next spot. I think that's a, a lot of wisdom. 20 episodes ago, I did an episode on, pay, on the power of paying it forward. Because, you know, with other people, we recognize there's so much power on those ripple effects we cause that sometimes we don't even see. Yeah. Uh, you know, that we are unaware that we made that impact. And, and I'm with you. I think definitely if we if we are more aware of that and, and in your book, you, you very much in one of your chapters is on a word I've before you. I only heard it like on religious settings, generosity. You introduced a concept into the workplace for me. And, and it was something that I have to say I kind of did naturally because my essence is to help others and I'm always trying to help others. And sometimes people close to me struggle because they think people are taking advantage of me. And I say, no, I'm doing it because I want to do it. They're not taking advantage. But, you know, it's something we struggle with. And you are big on that concept and it relates to what you just talked about. How did you come, where did you realize this was such a big deal with that teacher you mentioned? Well, let's be really clear for the people who don't have the context. Generous doesn't mean free. And generous doesn't mean that people are taking advantage of you. That if you have a factory and you give away all your stuff, you're going to go out of business. Of course. But if you make ideas and you give away all your ideas, you're going to do great. Because if you give somebody that, you still have it. And if you are able to exert emotional labor, to be present, to help somebody get to where they need to go, you still have all the things you had before you met them. And you also have the connection and the trust that came from weaving culture together. So generosity is this work of exerting emotional labor to help somebody else make our community better. And it is the opposite of the short-term hustle. It is the opposite of manipulation. It is the opposite of what's in it for me because it turns out that possibility begets possibility, that opportunity creates opportunity. And so we have this chance to weave together a better world, but we're getting distracted by the selfish people. But do you feel that like we're kind of on this trend and I think COVID in a way has helped a little bit where we are more open to having these discussions and how we can do good to others? Even just the fact that, that we are having these conversations. Yeah, I mean, I'm an optimist. The problem is that traditional models of capitalism, particularly in the media, are pushing forward divisive ideas and negative ideas and selfish ideas because that's how they make money. And so we have to counter that. We're not going to do it from the top down. We're going to do it peer to peer with each other. And so I'm trying to do that in a small way, but it's going to be take a lot of us for a very long time to push back against the hustle. Uh, I agree. And I think this what well, this is, even podcasting is such a powerful tool because I feel that, you know, there's there's layers and people and interconnections and this helps to to just get and reach more places and, and disseminate information and ideas and, and awakening in a way. 
Yeah. So and that's great. And I, I mean, not even mentioning finding your tribe, because one of the most powerful things that I find, and not to put a plug here, but it's true of the Akimbo programs and what you created, is not so much the content. The content is amazing, of course, but the community that is behind the content. And every time you present that, and it's not about just watch a video and learn, it's about engage with others. And of course, as you mentioned before, be generous and, and share your ideas. And, and that is really, for me, has been so empowering to finding those people because it had made me not to feel alone. You know, you have loved ones in your life that maybe don't are not on the same path. They don't follow your same journey. And that's OK. But you still want to talk about these things with someone. So that's something that finding your tribe that you also, you know, mentioned in so many of your blogs um, is so powerful. Yes. And they're not yours. The tribe would be there with or without you. They are simply people who will welcome you, who need you, who you can narrate for, who you can learn from. And the minute we treat them like they're ours, it stops working. It's about, here's this group of people that have chosen to align with each other. I would like to be part of that. That's incredible. And I'm telling you, I have good, I consider very good friends. Some of my TPF podcast fellowship fellows, I guess we never met in person, mm -hmm. but I, I, you know, consider that we've been already part of weddings and, and just the news That's of fantastic. weddings and just uh, being there for each other. And some of one, two of them added this podcast. So it's even business opportunities with virtual friendships and connections and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a game changer, really, when you, you realize that connections can be established this way as well. Love to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. And so changing gears a bit, I have a 10-year-old son, right? And a six-year-old daughter. But my son is very intellectual. You know, he's very intellectual. So I always share with him my plans. And he gives me the push. Christian, should I do the podcast? Yeah, mom, do the podcast. So of course, <laughs> of course, I told him, you know who I'm going to interview? I'm going to interview Seth Godin. Of course, he didn't know. And then this morning when I said, wish mommy luck, because I, the interviews today, I say, oh, I look him up on Google. <laughs> <laughs> the the duty school, he told me. <laughs> the duty school. So it made me think about, you know, I've heard your opinion about schools and the school system. And it's something I would love for you to share a bit here. And but the question is, and when you share your approach to how the society we created has established how we learn and how, you know, we we yeah, we acquire knowledge. To anybody that has a 10-year-old kid. Do you have any advice as to, of course, we have to send them to school, but do you have any thoughts or ideas of what you would instill in them at this point in their lives so that we can nurture that creative side? Your son and your daughter are really lucky to have you. So I'll start with that. Thank you very much. Um, I love public school. I think public school is really important because it helps create a center for our culture. But Public school is over at three o'clock in the afternoon. And so every kid is homeschooled from three o'clock in the afternoon to seven o'clock in the morning. And the question to parents is what are you doing with that time? What is school for? And in my uh, free book, Stop Stealing Dreams, I argue that school is for two things, which is solving interesting problems and leading. So the first thing that I think we have to inculcate in every single kid is that they are capable of doing those things, that it is expected that they will do those things, that compliance is insufficient, that deciding to love what you do is a skill, that you need to learn how to fail over and over again if you want to get better at something like riding your bicycle. These are all things we can teach our kid. Teaching our kid to like an A, to get an A, is trivially easy, right? That I was talking to a, a friend this morning, and he reminded me of the myth of Santa Claus, which is if you don't behave, Santa's not going to bring you a present. Well, that's a super easy way to bully a kid into doing what you want. But that's Training to work in the factory, 
that's training to work for the evil boss. I'd rather put a voice in a kid's head about the opportunity and obligation to make things better. And that getting something wrong is great if you learn something from it, because that is how we move forward. So with a 10-year-old in particular, your son can start editing Wikipedia today, and he can start publishing YouTube videos, and he can start learning a programming language. Because learning a programming language is a skill, and it is not age-dependent, and he's old enough to do it. And if he was a she, she would be old enough to do it. If you can figure out in five years of spending time between now and when they're 15, how to create someone who is resilient and generous and codes and publishes and learns, then you'll get through the teenage years just fine. But if all you've got is you better obey, then you've got troubles. Well, that, that's very valuable, you know, because I married a Dutch guy who is very unconventional as well in his thinking. So every time we kind of get together with other people, we kind of are a little bit on the outliers of mm -hmm. our thoughts. And uh, so our son, actually, he has a YouTube channel, believe it or not, that's already great. a little travel blog. And yeah, and we feel that we feel this responsibility that his brain power with that, like with any kid, not because he's gifted or anything. Like we don't define gifted in the way the school system does. And I almost like I, we talk about it with that. If they told us your child is gifted, he's going to go into the one gifted class in school. We almost don't want him to go to the gifted class. We want him to be with everybody else and have more time maybe to explore other things rather yep. than having this amazing, incredible set of curricula that now puts stress on his life. Correct. So, so that's uh, good to get that validated in recording so that I can, <laughs> when I'm doubting, I'll, I'll re-listen to, to the, to this episode. So Seth, of course, I, I want to give some time to your new book, The Practice Shipping Creative Work, which it's amazing. And, uh, I think this is like almost like I see it like a little Bible. Like you can open <laughs> and go to any section and it has some, so, you know, all your nuggets of, of wisdom in one place. Tell us about the book and how the idea come. And I know this wasn't the original uh, title for the book. And I think I, I'm with you. If you have eight hats, I'll take one. I like the trust yourself title. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a long time ago, I stopped trying to sell books because it's fine with me if no one buys a book. What I try to do is sell people on possibility. And so if the goal, if the outcome of our conversation today is that people think that they have the opportunity to show up and make things better, then we will have been successful. Because I write the book for the same reason, which is everyone has the leverage to do something that is creative, to do something that solves an interesting problem whether that's the way we raise our kids or the way we show up at the office. And the book is divided into 220-something sections, and the sections are about how we get in our own way and how we could stop getting in our own way. Because you have everything you need to begin. The hard part is simply beginning. I, I totally agree, and this is a great... For anybody out there that is stuck, as I was saying before, this is a great place to start. I always say that it's like doing a diet, right? You don't want to do it. Uh, you procrastinate, but then you take the necessary step, the courage to just start. And after three days, you already feel it in your body, the impact of eating better. And now you don't want to let go because you know you've invested into it and now you want to keep looking better and better. So the, the, the most difficult part of all of this is just get the book, buy the book and start reading it because after the first three pages, you're not going to put it down. So... That's very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, well, it's, it's honestly, it's the, it's the truth. And um, I know you are a busy man, so I'm not going to, I can talk to you forever, but I want to keep true to my episode. The one thing, any advice for when people put us down and the criticism, I think a lot of us get the, what yeah. people think of us, be that that component that really ruins a good thing. You are go doing good. For sure. <laughs> and then you want to share it with the world because, of course, <laughs> and then someone says something you don't like and then you just 
use it yeah. as the excuse to drop. So I would say, please remember that a lot of people who interact with you in your work, it's not for them. And so if uh, someone comes up to you and says, your work is terrible because I only speak Polish and you don't work in Polish, they're telling you something about themselves. They're not telling you something about you. Number two, most people don't know how to give feedback. And so if you get a piece of hurtful criticism, it could be because the person, it wasn't for them and they feel terrible. It could be because they're terrible at giving criticism. But neither of those things has anything to do with you. So seeking out people who are good at giving feedback, which is what Akimbo is built for, surrounding yourself with hundreds of other people who are good at it, is a gift. It's magic. It opens doors. But other people look for their fear, look for their stress, look for their pain. That's what they're telling you. They're not talking about you. Great. I appreciate that advice. So the last question would be, because back to basics is um, also about what do we do to stay true to ourselves? Like what, where do we go when things get tough and what reminds us of our true essence? So for me, there's a few things or places that I go or things that I do where I resource myself when I need that boost of energy and creativity. And I say, where do I go to tap into my inner, to my inner self? Uh, what, where does, where does Seth Godin go? So what does he do when you want to resource yourself? Uh, well, those are two different things because I don't think we have an inner self and I don't think we have a true self. I think we have adopted it over time. That if you'd grown up 200 years ago, or if you'd grown up 20,000 miles from here, you'd have a different true self. It is adopted. Okay. And for me, that place is in Canada, north of Toronto. Uh, this would have been my 43rd summer teaching up north. And something shifts inside of me when I'm there. That's great. That's great. So that connection with one particular place is really reminds you. And doing the work there. I go there and I work, you know, 15 or 20 hours a day for four days until I'm exhausted. And then I come home because the work is the easiest way to get back to who we are. Do the work. Well, I think that's a great way to close the interview. Guys, listening to this, do the work, uh, just, uh, you know, commit to it, show up. And, uh, you know, something that I learned from uh, Seth, which is, is ship, ship, ship. I call him the king of ship, ship, ship. My, <laughs> my husband is trying to get back into music. He's an engineer, but he's a musician as well. And sometimes he's not doing it. And I tell him, baby, ship, 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 like what Seth Godin does. You don't like the song? No, no. You just put it out there and, and keep writing. And so he he's <laughs> he's very thrilled about this interview, but uh, he sometimes is like, don't give me another set going. <laughs> I hear you. Well, thank you for making the podcast and congratulations on achieving such a milestone. It was great to talk to you. Thank you, Seth. Until our next episode and happy birthday back to basics. Bye-bye. Thanks. Keep making a ruckus. Thank you. You've been listening to Back to Basics. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. If you haven't yet, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts or any of your favorite streaming platforms. This is the best gift you can give us. Join me next week for another Back to Basics conversation. And if you want to find out about other exciting things I'm working on, visit LeticiaLatino.com. Thank you, and until the next time.